you stop losing control of yourself, this isn't the sentence. This is something else. You stop losing control of yourself when the unexpected comes up, when something goes wrong, when someone gives you an accusing glance. You stop losing control of yourself when your own tyrannical thoughts pounce on you, accuse you, try to carry you away. You refuse from this evening on. And I said anything to let anything carry you away. Not your own shame, not your guilt, not your feeling of being a very foolish and stupid human being. When you see yourself caught out of a role, you will refuse to be ashamed of yourself so that you can begin to understand that it was indeed a role. So there's really, really, as far as your inner self is concerned, no such thing as a surprise, a shock, an unexpected thing, but you're poised and you're authentically in charge of yourself every minute of the day whether other people think you are or not because they won't think you are because they're out of control they will automatically project their recklessness and think that you are living in the same state that they are but you will know better and you will feel better now for the sentence please then we'll get into the main topic a life of misunderstanding is not worth living. A life of misunderstanding is not worth living. I'll give you time to write it down. A life of misunderstanding is not worth living. Question. By that standard, those of you in this room and those of you listening to this tape, by that standard, is your life worth very much now? Is it worth living right now? To be so terrified of the smallest event that you block it out and want to turn away from it with the television program or to think about something else. So that you're not even able to face your own indecisions, your own lack of ability to look at anything, any daily event, the news, or something you have to do about the house. Look, do you understand that pain tension, anxiety, insecurity, this, you know, this nervousness that you have all day. Do you understand that it is based on just one thing? It's based on one thing. The fact that you misunderstand what you are all about as a man or as a woman here on earth. You misunderstand what you are all about, what you're supposed to be doing in this life. Therefore, misunderstanding yourself, your authentic place, your authentic purpose, you have no choice but to misunderstand everything that happens to you. Down at work, you can't, you can't understand why the social world makes it so rough on you why the price of houses go up so much that you can't afford one, or why you can't afford that particular course that you want to take to make a living or whatever. 
you can't understand why people are so thoughtless and so cruel and so demanding. You can't understand how to handle yourself or handle them, having found yourself trapped in a bad social situation. I wonder whether it has ever occurred to you for more than five seconds, whether it has ever occurred to you that if misunderstanding is our pain, which it is, then understanding is the absence of pain, is the cure for it. What blocks, what blocks you will find in your way if you get to this, to a, this simple conclusion. I'm anxious, I'm insecure all day long because I misunderstand myself and misunderstand, therefore, misunderstand life in general. This is why I'm afraid. This is why I don't know whether to make that telephone call or not to make it, or whether I should do this or that. And we're torn apart all day long simply because one thing, one thing we have not understood, as often as we hear it, we have not understood that we can't answer our problems on the level of our acquired thinking. We cannot solve the problem on the level of our acquired opinions, attitudes, beliefs, emotional reactions. So why don't we let them go? Why don't we come to that magnificent but at first terrifying point of saying, since my usual pretense toward that person in my life, you know that person you're pretending? You know who you're pretending to. Many people, aren't you? You're playing roles with them. Since my usual role, my usual pretenses toward them, doesn't keep me an understanding of what this relationship is, therefore not understanding it keeps me in tension, I'm not quite sure what to say to her or to him. Or when he or she says something to me, I really don't know whether I should laugh it off or take it seriously or be distressed by it or to cover up the way I really feel about it. I just don't know how to react to it. Of course you don't. Of course I don't. because we can't, haven't really understood what I said a minute ago, that all our acquired, acquired ways, responses of handling life are no good at all. Now, I will ask you, why don't you drop them? You know how important the phrase is, drop it, in this class? Why don't you drop it, give it up? so that you don't even know what you're going to do with your terror, with your fear of not having an answer. I said, so that you, you're so completely without an answer that you don't even know what you're going to do with this new fear, this tension, this insecurity that comes up, because you're not going to answer it all in your usual way. So if you don't know what to do with the fear, when you have a challenge, what do you do but stick with it? Stay with it. You see a curious thing happening. You'll see that without any particular effort on your part, without any strain on your part, that the fear will lessen and also it will, uh, I better stick with the word lessen, it will lessen grow less intense in your mind, and then you'll find yourself maybe giving your mind to something practical. Washing the dishes, or going shopping, or something like that. But you've met the challenge, at least, in a different way. Remember I started this evening by saying, 
You are not to lose control of yourself ever again in any kind of a situation. You are not to lose control of yourself. How do you do that? You do that by not being who you have always been. By not being who you think you are. For example, the person who has a ready answer, an instant response to this upsetting event that happened to you. How do you think, this is something to think about now, how do you think you would feel if you left a blank space instead of the usual response? The usual what? Find out what your dominating mood is. For example, maybe you go into depression. The person next to you may go into deliberately throwing up a wall so that you don't have to see clearly what the challenge is. Look how simple it is. We started off by saying that all anxiety, all pain, is caused by not understanding what I am all about, therefore not understanding what my true right relationship is with everyone else out in that world. I'll give you a perfect example of how misunderstanding can cause you more torment, more frustration, more anger, more hatred, more despair, more de depression, more agony, more hell. I'll put it a certain way. <clears throat> Don't you ever again try to make sense out of the social world you live in. The minute you try to make sense out of politics, out of ordinary religion, out of what we call social affairs, laws, wars. Anyone who tells you what causes a war, for example, the country needed more territory or they'd been offended by this other country, they are lying. They don't really understand. One of your greatest torments, which connects very much with money, is that you can't understand why in spite of your work, your plans, your intelligence, that your financial affairs are never, <coughs> never, never what you would like them to be, right? Who wants them to be that way? What idiot are you that you are going to demand a 50% raise in your salary so you can be happy. What kind of an idiot are you? Including those of you listening to this tape. There, there are about 50 misunderstandings in that attitude alone, which we could carry on, I'm sure, all night, but just approach it from one viewpoint. If you want more money, and if you get more money, once you have it in the bank, what's your state? Exactly the same as it was before. Because we fail to understand the simplest, some of you have been coming to this class for two or three years, you don't understand the simplest of principles, which is that nothing, nothing on the outside can make you authentically right on the inside. Nothing, that's the simplest. You, if you heard this perhaps the first time you came here and you still demand more money. There's no sense to the social system when you see that it arises from the madness of human minds, of human emotions. You are free of the whole business 
which would you rather be? I'm not saying this lightly. I'm saying this quite seriously. And you, I want you to answer this quite seriously. This is very important to you. You find out what goes on in your mind when I ask this intensely serious and important question. And I'll discuss it a bit because I know what's going to go on in your mind. Which would you rather be a billionaire or a free human being? A billionaire or a free human being? You say you'd like to have both? You take your choice. You take your choice that you're going to understand what it means to be inwardly free, to be emotionally free, mentally free. You're going to choose that. And then you see whether you ever again have anything whatever to do with the question that you want to be a billionaire, that you want the finest home in town. I must tell all of you in this group and those of you listening to this tape that you don't have one ounce of sense when it comes to money. You really don't. It's because you don't understand that money itself, you misunderstand money, you don't understand that money itself is a part of the whole fault system of society. The whole thing is fault. But you believe in it. You still believe in money, pieces of paper or coins. You believe it can contribute something to you. You need it basically, of course, for the home and for food. But when you really understand it, what little you have or the billion dollars that you have will mean nothing because your total understanding of yourself will include the fact that you understand that when you die, that billion dollars in the bank account it will do you no good, whatever. Do you love money? Oh, maybe I better change that a bit. Do you love money for what it will give to you, for the security it will give to you? You had better forget all about finding security in money. Just forget it. You're not going to find it. Try to find some place in your life where you're terribly confused about something. What is it? We just talked about money. Could it be a human relationship? Could it be that you, could it possibly be that you don't understand how your own mind operates? Why don't you make a program for the rest of your life, which you will need, by the way, for the rest of your life to begin to comprehend how your thoughts operate? Have you ever asked yourself where a thought comes from? Think of anything right now, all of you. Those of you, think of anything. Think of the ceiling if you want. Where did the thought come from? Wouldn't it be interesting to, to probe into it and find where they come from as a beginning to understand how we can permit only right thoughts, constructive thoughts on every level, thoughts will, will give us the understanding that will keep us in command of ourselves, keep us from feeling ashamed, feeling weak. very simple. All you have to do is say to yourself, I misunderstand what I am all about. I really do. I misunderstand it and it causes me endless agony all day long. Things do not turn out the way I want. They just don't turn out the way I want. In spite of every effort that I make to try to make them turn out the way I think will make me feel secure and happy. They can't be caught. They won't bend to me. They don't obey what I say, do they? They, they just don't obey at all. 
then maybe, then maybe I should not be thinking certain thoughts because these thoughts are not necessary. Maybe if I am authentically in charge of my mind, maybe if I am charge of, in charge, command my mind, then I don't have to command that wife, that husband, that boyfriend, that girlfriend. Maybe I don't have to fawn. Maybe I don't have to promise. Maybe if I am free from myself, I am free from that man and from that woman and from the five billion people on earth. Which is a fact. So what are you going to do with the rest of your life but come to these meetings and read books and examine yourself all day long and have the courage, first of all, to admit, to admit, you listen, to admit that you are incredibly confused. You know, you know that you should boil cabbage for 10 minutes or sweep the f floor once a... How often do you sweep floors? Sweep the floor once a day. And you'd better be on work at work at 8 because the boss says so. That doesn't take any effort. That's mechanical. That rules by itself. How about obeying one of the rules of this class, which is to start to do something you don't want to do by trying to understand something that you don't presently understand. And basically, the reason you don't understand it is because you're thinking with the intellect, which is connected with our egotism, which says, if I think this, I will get a certain result for me. If I, if I study these books on making money, on becoming popular, on entertaining myself, if I can figure out enough ways to entertain myself, then I will be happy. But you won't be, and you never have been. Because the thoughts that said, if I do this or do that, then I will be happy for wrong thoughts having no connection with your real nature at all. So all our life we've been doing a, a very foolish thing, trying to make someone happy who is incapable of being made happy. Remember we once said, stop trying to please people who are incapable of being pleased. Who is it in your life? You're trying to please someone in order to hold them. How dumb you are, how you're ruining yourself, and how you permit that other person to ruin your life. Okay. How about making a decision to no longer please the neurotic parts of you that are incapable of being pleased, that every time you do something for them, they demand twice as much. Aren't you sick of that? Aren't you tired of trying to feed a monster that is never satisfied? But if I don't feed him, he'll leave me. If I don't please him, I'll feel empty. How uncourageous you are. Ladies, let him leave. Men, let her leave. Be lonely. Be lonely in a new way. You stop feeding yourself with thrills 
of any kind, I said any kind, you stop feeding yourself with thrills. Because have you ever noticed you can't get enough? Have you ever noticed that no matter how many thrills you give yourself, the next day you have to start all over again, wearily thrilling yourself again with what? With thoughts, with emotions, with entertainments, with dreams of what you're going to do in the future, with one form or another of conquest. I'll tell you what to do. Then we'll have a break. Sometime you sit home all by yourself. Someone is there, you sit quietly in another room. Get by yourself. And you make up your mind that you're going to clearly understand the necessity for you to lose. You're going to understand the necessity for you to lose everything in you that is driving you nuts. And you start, as best you can, defying, defying not anything out there, but everything in here that wants to scare you. You begin defying it with the knowledge that you collect here. You be begin to defy it persistently. You defy it best of all, and listen to this, and you're quite welcome to take a deep breath of relief and satisfaction when I say this. You begin to defy your own emotional and mental misunderstandings. Defy them because you are capable of defying them with the power of God himself. Did that simple fact ever occur to you? We're not being religious. I hope you know that. We're factual, not religious, and that's true religion. I hope you understand that what you can't do, what you can't do, God will do for you if you'll get out of the way. If you'll practice getting out of the way. You've heard that before, I know. Now you're seeing how to do it in a very real way and very individually. So you sit at home, and you watch those terrors that say, I'd better write that letter in order to achieve this result. I'd better think this in order to escape my pain. You watch how your mind works, begin to understand it, and you defy every wrong thing, every wrong feeling that goes through you, every feeling that tells you that you had better be insecure and afraid, and you defy it, you say no, and I'll permit you to scream no if you want. What a remarkable thing happens if you will do this and do it persistently, and I'll put it very simple. What I'm telling you is the truth. You will begin to scare the devil, dark forces. You'll begin to scare them so badly that they will want nothing more to do with your mind. They will want nothing more to do with your life. You are afraid of them. You're reversing it. They will be afraid of you, and I will guarantee you they will go away and leave you alone, which is what you want. <laughs> They will leave you alone. They will give you up. You're no longer a sucker. When you cease to fear them, listen, when you cease to fear them, they depart. You find out for yourself. I've told you this. I've just told you a magnificent fact. You find out by your experiment that what I have told you is true in your personal life. You can do it. God will help you. Truth will help you. It wants to. It's just waiting for you to be willing to give up your fear. Give up your fear. Drop it. 
so that something that is not a part of that fear can take over to work for you, to give you the understanding that sets you free inwardly. Yeah. Write down a sentence, which isn't just uh, clever words, but something to think about. Learn to rest and rest to learn. Learn to rest and rest to learn. You know what we're going to do this morning? We're going to let ourselves naturally, quite naturally, and easily, and casually fall into the opposite of the mood, the atmosphere, the procedure of last night. Last night was very active, wasn't it? We were all working hard. Oh, were you working hard last night? You were working hard being receptive? This morning, we're going to just be in a very restful, quiet mood, not forcing in anything. I deliberately refused through watching my own state before the meeting refuse to have any topic at all to plunge straight down the line with. But just to rest. We're going to take a rest this morning. And in this state, which is the opposite of last night, we can learn just as much as we did last night. Because different centers will be receptive. Instead of straining our minds perhaps to understand something or even being agitated by it. I'm going to rest, be quiet, and see what comes out of that. How often during your day do you find it very difficult to be in a restful state of mind, even to relax your physical body? Which means if you're not able to do that, that we're taken over by all these mechanical, impulsive, compulsive, neurotic forces in us that won't let us rest, that won't leave us at peace at all, but demands, demands that we think hard about something and threatening you with disaster if you don't think hard about something. And because we're ignorant, because we're asleep, because we don't understand, because we have all this misunderstanding we talked about last night, we listen to these slave, slave masters. We're the slave, they're the master, these thoughts are the master. We listen to them and are quite sure that we must obey their demand that we chase around, that we think hard, that we try to solve problems, and we have no idea how to solve them because our minds and our feelings are in contradiction. You know what we're going to do right now? You do it now. You change your physical position right now so you're nice and comfortable. Your physical body gets the message first. The physical body gets the message first. And it transmits the message to all the other parts of us, which says, don't expect anything. Look, you came to this meeting this morning, you expected certain things to be given you. That part is quite, quite correct. Don't ask what dish will be served you here, because the menu is quite varied. Sometimes it's pretty rough fare. Sometimes it's the dishes you don't like. The sauces are too spicy or something. Don't expect any kind of a dish at all. Then, then, whatever is served you will be, let's follow the example, will be nutritious. So sitting here quietly now, not demanding a thing, not demanding that I teach you in a certain way or teach you a certain thing, not even having any questions at all. Do you see what this does? It breaks 
the mechanical flow of our inner state, which says, I wonder, you may be wondering this quite unconsciously, whether today will be like last night, or what it will be like, or what I will get from it. Why don't you let truth itself decide what you need? This morning, we're going to take a rest. Because in that restfulness is silence. And in that silence is a deeper receptivity. Having the sense to get our nonsense out of the way, to get our clamoring minds out of the way, we can settle down. We can then listen to something other than what we've listened to ever since we got out of bed this morning. So from this point on, turn the arrow back right now as I'm talking to you. Turn the arrow back and see what's going on inside of your mind, inside of your whole psychic system. You may find it a bit uncomfortable, something you prefer not to do. Because it is much easier to come here and put your attention up at me, which you're now doing, and listen to me give a talk to which you simply respond. You respond, I do the work, you respond to it. Are you watching my face? You're watching my gestures. That's easy to do. That's very familiar and it's very comfortable because this is the way we spend most of our time looking at someone else without any attention, back to ourselves. So while we're being quiet here this morning, see if you can even begin to understand what it means to sit quietly and not care what happens, because you're not trying to force anything to happen. You're defying properly. You're defying with proper understanding the mad mind that many of you had out in front here, compulsive talking, right? Saying things because you thought you had to make that remark to someone else. Obeying the dictator of your conditioning, of your familiar thinking habits, without even knowing that you were obeying what your mind said. Your mind said, I'll take Rudy as an example. Rudy was talking to Juan. Rudy was talking without knowing he was talking. Juan was listening without knowing he was listening, as an example. And so Rudy said things to Juan, maybe several things to him, without knowing that he had a certain weariness with keeping up the blab game not even knowing that he would rather would rather have been thinking his own thoughts or thinking no thoughts at all. Rudy would rather have been in rest out there. If you put yourself in your position when you were talking out there, some of you are in here. You may have found, if you were attentive to yourself at the same time, that you'd like to stop thinking and stop blabbing and maybe stand by yourself out there and do what your natural self wanted to do with all these energies that you have in here. If you had made the decision when you drove up here that you were going to sit quietly either in here or out there and converse if someone talked to you, obviously you talked back respond to them. But if you had made up your mind, made a decision that you're going to simply be quiet here in this room, 
passive, passive, instead of active as you were driving out here, watching for policemen or watching for whatever, or just letting your thoughts run mad, if you made the decision that when you entered this room, you were going to live your own life from the time that you walked in here until the time that the meeting started, you were going to do, listen to this, you were going to do what you wanted to do. Instead of being taken over by the noisy compulsion of your own feelings, of your own words, of your own mind, even of, of your physical gestures. Moreover, if when sitting here quietly, doing what you want to do, instead of behaving the way you think you're compelled to behave because you're in this room, moreover, you could have you could have just sat back and let nothing happen, not expecting, not wanting anything to happen, so that you were nothing but a responder even to your own thoughts. Then you could choose, so to speak, whether you wanted to think those thoughts or not, or just let them go. So that you're at rest right in the middle of the room, and if someone spoke to you, you would remain at rest because your old self would not activate itself to answer to Juan or to Rudy or to Sally, not answer to them in the way you feel you're compelled to. Do you know, do you know that you can, uh, I can say this to you, I wouldn't use this particular phrase to uh, too many people that misunderstand, but to you I can say it. Do you know that you can lead a conscious double life? You're sitting in the room here and somebody says something to you. You have no interest whatever in what they're talking about. And maybe you'll see that you are not compelled to have an interest when they start telling you about their pansy garden or about what they're going to do tomorrow. You used to, you used to pretend an interest in that because you felt that it was the thing to do and you didn't want to hurt them or disappoint them. You sensed they're kind of egotistical about it. And so you played the game, but you resent it or wish they'd shut up. And so you're divided. I will teach you a new way to be divided, which is not divided at all. Which is when one starts talking about his avocado ranch, you're looking at Juan, you're listening to him, you understand why he wants to talk about that, because he, he planted 20 trees yesterday and he's telling you all about it. You can see that he, Juan, is absorbed in his avocado trees, and this is the only thing that exists to him. Therefore, he thinks I, you, should be interested in it too. All this you understand quite clearly. So you listen to Juan quite consciously, the arrow pointed back here. So at the same time, he's blabbing on about what he wants to talk about, his personal interest. You're listening attentively, and you're not putting on a phony act. You're listening to every word he says. At the same time, you are living your own free life because there's no resentment there at all. You don't care what you think about. You might as well think about his avocado trees as listen to him because you have no neurotic need to think about your apple trees. You are at rest. Whatever happens in this room or whatever doesn't happen. You're in command of yourself, having no aggressive need. Listen to this. Having no aggressive need to impose your compulsions, your neurosis, on anyone else in the room. Because you don't have it anymore. Because you've worked that hard on yourself.
Not yet, it's going around though. There's one of those in there, so. Oh, how about the volume? to be marked but more especially to make a lesson very specific you will be conscious you will be aware of how you Im try to impose your false life onto the person you're talking to I said you will be aware of how you try to impose your nervousness your compulsion your interests onto whoever you're talking with and the minute you catch it if you catch if you can catch it in the middle of not only of a sentence but of a word you will stop right in the middle of that word ava for avocado ava give yourself a shock and give yourself a rest aren't you tired of blabbing so much about yourself Aren't you tired of trying to prove that that grove of avocado cheese is really important to you and it's not important at all? What you really want is to be an authentic, authentic, self-liking, therefore an authentic liking with other people in which there's no mutual imposition of your private life on each other. You want someone to like you? That's not wrong. You know why that is right? It's because wholeness, self-harmony, is a state of liking because it is wholeness itself. Is it not? Is it not? How can you dislike truth when it's in you? Therefore, you, you understand I'm using common words? When you are whole, you like yourself. You like your life. You like this freedom you have of not compulsively imposing yourself on it. You like that. When the other person, Juan or Dorothy, are also in this state, you both exchange, you exchange what you like in yourself and you like it in them. So you like them, which is not demand, which is not desire, but it's the same thing as liking yourself. And that is rest. Why don't you stop? Why don't you stop struggling so anxiously for the answers so you can see that the capital A answer is something quite different than the results of your struggling for an answer which you've never answered anything. I just did come to a stop. Start all over right now. Don't think of anything at all. We've got a fresh start right now. Now do you see, now do you see that there is really no problem 
Now do you see that there is really no problem except as my mind creates it through thinking incorrectly? You're thinking that there's something I have to chase and finally catch if I'm ever to be happy. There's no problem when I give up the chase. There's a problem only when I chase. Real honestly now and real bravely, how many of you here have ever been to a talk, this class, in which you were disappointed in the class, in that you felt you didn't get enough or didn't get what you wanted or it didn't go the way you wanted. Have you, any of you, I'm speaking generally, ever been disappointed? Let's see your hands, please. Is there anyone here who wasn't disappointed? Here? Let me get those names, Joe, and they're the nice <laughs> people. I like that. Yeah, get that name, that girl over there. Uh -huh, I understand, but we're, we're getting something out of the unconscious. We're, trying, we're probing this. All right. You were disappointed in the talk. What did you want? What did you want? Furthermore, furthermore, did you like to say something? <laughs> no? What did we want? Miracles. Ah, miracles. Ah. Furthermore, who wanted what you wanted? I asked you who wanted what you wanted. Your anxiety wanted something to relieve it, and you were so disappointed that that nice man, that that man up there, didn't relieve your anxiety. How terrible. Nobody serves you properly, do they? What were you disappointed in? Are you able to look at it a little bit on the surface so we can go deeper into it and find out what's the basis of you being disappointed in what you get here or don't get here? What were you disappointed in? Yes, Zena. I can remember, Vernon, when I first came here that uh, I would hear you say something over and over again, and I said, well, I'm, you know, you Okay. Give me something new, Vernon. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Yes. I wanted peace of mind, and all you did is totally disrupt my mind. <laughs> <laughs> Give you less peace of mind, huh? <laughs> right. What else were you disappointed in? <clears throat> Yes, Lee. I know this is going to sound wrong before I say it, and I'm going to say it anyway. I was disappointed in the other students that they didn't pay attention as much as I thought I was doing. I know how that sounds. Yeah, okay. Yes, Dorothy. I was disappointed because you didn't recognize all of my fine qualities. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're all looking for <laughs> Larry, yeah. That's the strange part of it. You do recognize this little fine quality that we have that keeps us coming back? The finest quality you have is your conscious misery. Repeat, the finest quality you have is your conscious misery, if you have even that. Or do you have unconscious misery in which you know very well you could have given a much better and more loving talk than that man did? All right. How many of you are how many of you uh, are disappointed that you didn't meet a nice man or woman of the opposite sex here? <laughs> or if you did see spot someone that looked I'll wait till you recover. <laughs> or if you did spot someone who looked pretty good to you, there are all kind of barriers in the way, including your own timidity or what the boss would say, or whether he or she would even like you in return because you're not very likable at times. Do you know why we're here? First of all, to find out what we're really like, what goes through our minds, what really goes through our minds, which are quite hidden from us because we play the role right here in this class. Now, come on. Let's see. Let's find out. 
Who will tell us why they come here? Who knows why they come here? <laughs> Blair is the only one. Putting it in past tense, I do know thoughts that were in my head of why I came here, which I consider private, which are gone now. Really? Yes. Okay. Why do you come here? Well, first, because you push my buttons, and I react to the things you say, and I see better into myself. When, when you make statements about us, and I think about them during the week, I see this happening in myself, which I, I was unaware of. I really saw I wasn't observant of what I am or where I am. All right. And so, thirdly, I've never heard these truths before, or they didn't fall in the right center on me, because it's like a new world and a new language, and these ideas are working. Yes, that, that's good. New world, new language. Quite true, isn't it? Virginia? I get something here that I can't get anywhere else. And all my corns have stepped on. Yes. Uh, Sally? It's my only hope for sanity. Only hope for sanity. Jean? I know that I cannot do it alone. How true, John? They all said it, that... Uh, this is my only hope for sanity, and how can I learn sanity from an insane person, which is really what the world is all about today? Mm -hmm. But I can learn sanity from the same person. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get discouraged? Let's go back to the business of your relationship to this class here. Do you ever get discouraged that you're not going fast enough? Mm -hmm. uh, and and you, wish, you wish something would happen something outside of you would happen maybe tonight will be the night he gives the talk in which you will be able to go faster to get more you feel as if you're kind of what's the right word in a rut in the class have you ever felt you're in a rut in the class nothing new happens huh i'll tell you whether you're aware of it or not if you do come here and listen with that one ounce of receptivity that we talk so much about things are happening I will guarantee you that. If you have that one degree of receptivity, things are happening. The lady mentioned miracles. The real miracle is to continue to come here with that 1%. That's a mir the beginning of the miracle of inner transformation for you. Jim? I would like to believe what everybody else said is the reason I come. But most of the time I can see perhaps it's compulsive, mechanical, habitual. But yet, last night somebody asked a question, and on the way home I thought, you know, after pretty near three years, the question, when you ask a dumb question, that's the imp that we're fighting. Yes. That is asking that question. Correct. And then all of a sudden you see, Gee, that little wee bit, if I could understand what I said, I would be free. If you could see the imp? Yeah. Remember, we're resting, working hard. Go ahead. Well, uh, I know before coming here, Vernon, I did read of one of uh, Nicole's That's I very good. Yes. Yes. Uh, Bob. Yeah, I was, I've been looking for the truth. You shall find the truth, the truth shall make you free. And so you say, what is truth? And you're the, you and your books are the only ones that have, have, have ever strung it out in sentences so that you can begin to understand. That's what I was. Truth is the absence of falsehood. Work from that viewpoint. Truth is the absence of falsehood. And the longer you come, <laughs> the more you know that you're not, and it's going to take a lifetime or longer. Say that last sentence again. 
it's going to take a lifetime or longer. Or longer. Let me figure that yeah. one out. <laughs> <laughs> you might not even do it in a lifetime. It's so much. Okay. Even the smallest okay. thing okay. is very, very difficult. Yes, the smallest thing. Because you have been seeing things for years and years, and we don't understand them. And then years later, we get a glimpse of what you're trying to tell us. Uh, and a simple sentence, like, stay with the fear, who understands that, really? Until you actually begin to do it a little bit, and you see how you never stay with the fear. Sure. You never do, but if you do it a little bit, you're terrified. Okay. And you know what you have been talking about for years, hmm. and we never understood it. That was very well said, Sally. That was superb. Uh, Jean. What Sally just said, especially the beginning part, relates to me, to what Dorothy said last night about the work picking you, not you picking the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the more I come to this class, the more I am amazed at you finding it all by yourself. Because I can see the resistance is tremendous. It's a rough battle, kids. But we're not going to be afraid of it. We're going to work right in the middle of our fear, right? Mm -hmm. Right in the middle of it. Uh, whose hand did I see? Uh, Larry, then Joan. I feel part of the reason I stay in and with this group is that I see the others that either come and stay or come and go have also been through the false trips, the false offshoots that I have and realize that is not it. That is not the answer to what I see. What you I see. you see that fairly clearly, don't you, Larry? Yes. There's yes. no point going the old ways anymore, is there? No. And you've dropped them you've dropped them somewhat. Sure. Uh Joan. I know that you know things about each one of us that others don't know about us and that we usually don't know about ourselves and that even the so-called, um, well, so you were saying something before about dynamic talk, you know, the dynamic speakers and the psychologists and psychiatrists don't, wouldn't know these things about us either because they don't know themselves. So here we have someone who really knows and can give us the different shocks that we need at the time they're needed. Do you know how I can help you in connection with what Joan said? I don't at all, I don't at all believe in your darkness as you do. I don't believe in it at all. I don't accept it. I don't go for it. Understand, Bob? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, John. One more thing. I know you don't want anything from us, which okay. is certainly not true. Oh, Larry. Another thing I can <clears throat> see myself doing as time goes along in this class is a coward to ask a certain question. The cowardice in me that would make me feel like I'm pleading, and I'm not a pleader, I think. Okay? But to watch another one in the sense, plead, Vernon, give me an answer, and see myself in that same pleading state, but a coward to say, Vernon, uh, I'm scared. Do you remember the exercise we had maybe three or four months ago? As a matter of fact, I will lead into it in a little different way. I would like three people different people to ask me any question. Think of some good question you'd like to ask. Will you please ask me a question, anyone? Anyone? Joan? What is truth? What is truth? Someone else, ask me any question at all. Do you feel you're out of the falsehood of life? Do you feel you're out of the falsehood of life? Okay. How can I get over being afraid all the time? Okay. Joan, you answer your own question. All right, let's have one more. You said that nice and loud, please. You said that we 
should consider ourselves as separate from suffering and Krishnamurti said you are that suffering and don't separate yourself from it so that no no uh -huh. are you asking that as a question okay yeah. okay fine fine uh, Joan you answer your own question I can only, I can't say what truth is from my own experiencing of it, but it would seem to me that the more I see what's false, what is false about me, and therefore that I can see what's false about others, I will understand what truth is. But there is a, truth is something you can't define in words, it's about words, thoughts, ideas. Quite right. All right, Larry, you answer the question you asked me. My question was, do you, Vernon, feel you're out of the false of the light? The question is wrong because the asker is wrong. The asker is wrong in asking the question. If you are, <clears throat> I either know you are or I wouldn't be here. Besides, what good does it do you whether I am or not? It's your life. It's just me asking the question. Okay, Dorothy. Answer your own question. What was the question? Huh? <laughs> How can I stop being afraid all of the time? Right. Tell us. To work while being afraid. Good. What is your first name, please? Mildred. Mildred, Mildred answer your own question, please. Well, as an observer of suffering, then I do step Correct. away from it. Correct. and get a better perspective and feel I'm not a part of it. Correct. Correct. Essentially, from a higher fact, we are not we are not our own suffering. We are suffering, but we are not really that as an identified human being who is suffering. Not from a higher viewpoint. From the lower viewpoint we are, of course I'm suffering. Suffering is very real. It's not a, a myth. I'm feeling it. I am that. I am that suffering, correct? I am that state. But that's not who I really am. That's who I insist I must be because I want to be an independent agent apart from God. I am a sufferer. Now I call on God and deepen the division. God save me from my suffering. He never will. It's a wrong question. It's a wrong move. If I stand apart and see that I have identified with my suffering, I've called myself a sufferer whom Christ died to save. I'm giving myself a name, a label, therefore I'm, I'm apart from the whole, apart from God. If I can stand apart and see that I am taken over by my own labels, calling myself a persecuted sufferer, if I can see that, I can see that it's a false identification, I can then die to it. I can die to it. Now I am one by not dividing myself, by standing apart and saying that I'm a sufferer. Therefore, I stick with it till I begin to understand what I must do is to die to me. This is a device to stand aside and observe. It's a device, a proper use of the, of the mind on its own level to observe something. But I don't identify with what I observe. Otherwise, I observe myself as someone who can save this country by being elected to office. I have given myself a label. That's a lie. I'm nobody at all. I don't have to be. I can be at rest being nobody, being nothing at all, which means I am the whole business. To be nothing is to be the whole business. But I don't think about it, do I? The minute I think about it, I call my, the minute I call myself a child of God, curiously, I'm separated from God. Right? The whole point of this being, let's have the courage to begin to answer our own questions, which simply means to struggle with them. Remember we had a talk on struggling? To struggle with them on the level of ordinary thinking. Look, how many of you have muddled minds? Don't you think we had better begin to work on that level properly instead of asking way up here, let's get way down here, huh? Let's see when we go into a grocery store and one 
can of corn is, is 28 cents and the other is 26. We don't drive ourselves nuts over two cents either way. huh? Don't you think that would be very profitable not to waste that energy in two cents? People, some certain people who give mighty sermons on television with millions of uh, the listeners drive themselves nuts over two cents on the can of corn. I'm beginning to really see that all these lofty, uh, you know, like questions and pondering about all this, and we can't even crawl. We want to, like, Jimmy and I were talking about this coming out in the car, that we want to walk on the water and we can't even crawl. Yes, It's that's just good. a distraction. It's the devil, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. All right, I'll give you something to think about. Let's open it up here. Listen to this, and then somebody comment. Evil always calls evil good. Evil always calls evil good. Can you give a historical example, if, if you can't do any better than that? What would be a historical example of that? Then maybe we can get more psychological about it. Yeah. Pardon? Hitler, yes, perfect example. It is good and necessary that we conquer the world for the sake of the world, of course. The Christian war. Hmm. The Christian war. Christian wars, yes. The crucifixion. Crucifixion, it was necessary to crucify that man who broke this Sabbath laws or whatever. Where are we doing it inwardly? You know where we do it? By refusing to give up familiar habits of thinking, we are calling that evil good because we think it's necessary to maintain this network of familiar thoughts in order to keep me and my, quote mark, security in place. I must make demands, I must make demands on other people that they behave in a certain way that pleases me. I'm calling that, that is evil, but I'm calling it good because I assume that there's a separate entity here who must be, uh, what's the right word, who must be confirmed by you behaving the way that pleases me. If you leave me after uh, a year or ten years, I call that bad, don't I? Why do I call, call it bad? Why do I call it anything at all? Because I think there's a me there who is affected by it know me at all that's affected by it. Aren't you tired of being afraid of people leaving you, for example? Or of not finding them in the first place? Which is it? Or both? It'll be both one. And our suffering blames itself on other people when it's exploiting those other people to keep itself in place. Say that last part again. It's exploiting the other people to keep itself in place. Yes, always, always. Putting pressure on other people. Keeping them around so they can continue to suffer. Do we have any martyrs in this group? <laughs> One martyr, two martyrs, three <laughs> martyrs? <laughs> Jones a martyr, martyr? We have <laughs> all right we'll take another little little angle how many of you in this room like me i'm talking about me i want to find out i want to get this one down. take names y'all Juan's a little doubtful. <laughs> okay. Huh? Yeah, but I mean, you I wait. idolize, you know, do the same thing. You idolize me, Juan? Yeah. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you ruined it. Go ahead. 
I, with me, you have to ask me, when do I like you? I like you when you're pleasant to me. When you bawl me out, I don't like you. So obviously, you know, I can't raise my hand either way. All right. Then we touched on, is someone else want to come in? Oh. We touched on this briefly last night with Dorothy. We'll go over it again. All right, those of you nice people who like me, how could I offend you so that you would hate me? Where could I touch you? Where could I behave toward you in some way where you would hate me? Uh, yes? Would you please do so? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Bob Sally. Is this proper? For example, I like you, I respect you, I understand you. Is it possible for you to say something to me where wherein I'm going to say I hate you, you're no good, so and so? Oh sure. Is, is this proper? Oh yes. Yes. What if I stole your beautiful girlfriend, Bob? You can have her. Huh? <laughs> 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 I this shot about I love you and bam, five minutes later I hate your gut. I, I don't think this is possible. I, <laughs> you know, if, if you love someone, you're going to you're going to see through the oh. Bob. Oh. <laughs> Slow down. How many people are in you? How many are in me? Mm -hmm. Quite a few, I guess. Yeah. You understand right. why I said that? Go ahead, sir. I was going to say at this particular moment, I like you. Yeah. Right. Ah, right. yeah. Because there's all these different things. Right. I don't see it that way. I, uh, when you commit yourself, you're committed, you know. Somebody help Bob, please. <laughs> Larry, are you help Bob. Arguing, are you arguing with somebody yourself or somebody? Are you? Are you? Yeah. All right. All right. All right. Bob, Calm down. Jim. On the, of course, we were talking in the restaurant, and you have read the Bible quite a bit. Do you remember when the disciples said, Jesus who? No, I don't know the man. Yeah. Where were they? Did they not confess their love and affection before? Did not Peter say, I will never deny you? He was closest. All right. Okay. That, I, 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 I know what you're getting at. Yeah, I know what you're getting at. Bob or anybody, when you say you like me, what are you talking about? Yeah. What are you talking about? You mean that at that present I haven't offended you? Is that what you mean? What are you talking about? You know, when you offend me, and you have. Oh. <laughs> no, no. I don't say Vernon is a no good rat and all these other people. I'm not going to. I say to myself, okay, what's bothering you about what he said? And yeah. I say to me. Okay. Because it's not your fault. You're simply, as far as I'm concerned, you're simply laying it on the line, and this is good. We put it out in the light of day, and if the sun doesn't shrivel it up, then you better do something with it because it's it's, uh, it's going to last. So I don't take offense. I look and see what it is in, in me. Comments? I don't know if I saw a hand or not. I'm sorry. Uh, yes. Okay, then. Again, I forgot what it's going to say. So I'll pass. <coughs> Joe. Well, I, this is it. That what uh, Sally said. What you said that there are so many people in me that it depends on what person is in charge in me at the time, whether it's you or whether it's anyone else, and the way I react. And the person that I may have been lavish about five minutes before is one that I could turn on and be furious at. So obviously, how can anyone say I like or even I hate? Dirt. Yeah. If you are, not you personally, but if someone else is feeding my neurosis at the time, I probably like them. If they're not doing anything, I'm probably somewhat indifferent to them. And if they are threatening my neurosis at the time, then I hate them. Yeah, that's good. That's very good. Sure. Okay, now let me ask you. Bob, that. then Richard, yeah. Okay, what state of completion is that? statement in what state of what state of, 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 of reaching the eventual heights is that is it way down oh, oh yes very, oh yes of course that's very uh, that's very low level living uh, Dorothy not, <laughs> not, 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 not to personally <laughs> 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 
Uh, oh, yes. Uh, we got to get to Richard, then Lorraine. Richard. Well, to like, to hate, are the same thing as a one-stick. Yes. And to say, I like you, someone has to be like you. Someone must want something. Someone, well, either wants something. There's someone there that is doing the liking. If there's someone there that can do the liking, there's someone there that can do the hating. Correct. Very good. Is that right? Oh, sure. Yeah. You didn't know that? I didn't know that. Now you know that. Yeah. I ain't gonna buy it yet. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the first reaction was, yes, I like Vernon's teacher. That's all I know, really. I don't know Vernon's man. Uh, I, don't, I don't see uh, an ego. So we're, I'm used to liking or disliking people that I know. And... Um, that's from my ego standpoint, as Dorothy pointed out. But somehow, uh, I don't know if I like you or dislike you. Mm. I don't see anybody there to dislike at the moment, mm. unless you threaten my false ego. I don't know if I like you or dislike you either, and I don't really care. <laughs> <laughs> because my hang up within me is if I like you, I fight like hell to get Excuse me, that's $1. Yes, it is. Yes, I'll do it on the way out. Okay, don't forget. I fight to win your approval. I try to do everything, quote, right in order that you think nice of me. If I stay separate from you at this point, I find I absorb what you're saying without putting my personality and trying to get close and trying to make you like me to get your approval or, mm. or afraid of your disapproval. Mm. And I... Yeah. I don't want to know you. I don't want to know anything about you. I don't want to like you. I don't want to dislike you. You are concerned with yourself to straighten yourself out, right? Right. right. And so is everyone else of us in this room, including myself. In other words, the, if you say suffrage and I take umbrage to it, and I don't like you, there's something wrong with me. Yes. If, if, why, why, why do you go either? Why do you like or dislike, as Richard said? Yeah, right. Okay. Um, by the way, let me say something then, the two ladies, those of you who are new. If you say a bad word, a crude word, a swear word, a foul word, you're fined a dollar. Put it in a basket. Be nice. Use nice language. With a real part of me, I would like not to like you in order to see my chief feature, that which, that which all gets disturbed. Well, to be indifferent is, is all right, if you, as long as you want us to be indifferent toward me. You're here, you want something, you want something in this yes, room? Yes. Uh, yes. That if you're going to ad admire me as Juan does, uh, <laughs> what was the word? Idolize. Idolize. Okay. Nothing. Nothing. I told you, Juan, to the degree Juan idolizes me, he's going to hate me. Okay. Right? All right? You got it. Now you got it. Mildred. <clears throat> Then to dissolve that censure so that there is neither liking nor disliking is to be free to love. Ah, yes, of course. Above that is something that is very real, that can have authentic affection, real affection. Don't you have affection when you sometimes, when we sometimes catch a rare glimpse of decent behavior? Look, uh, you know, not even in this class, I don't anywhere. You see someone who for maybe in a small way, or, but and yet in a very definite way, is free of himself for a moment. That, not, it, not, doesn't that arouse love in you? Uh, I don't know where we are. We're with Bob. And you said many times that you, you have to get to the point where you can walk in and out of things, mm -hmm. people, and etc. And I don't know, uh, this is what I try to do. And sure. Sure. By seeing you're really not connected with that situation, except in your own mental attachment, your own mental attachment, which means that you there's desire or there's heartache or whatever. Conquer that. Then is there a real attachment or is there just one whole thing which you understand and therefore can walk in or out? Uh, Joe and Jim. The thing is, you're a human being who's giving us the truth. We get hung up on you, then 
we're reacting to you, and the truth is, is secondary. And this is happening, I would say, with every true teacher down to, as, I don't know how many thousands of years. They still idolize Christ, but do they try to do anything about the, the truth that he taught? So uh, that comes into it also, that Vernon the man might be likable, but when he states certain truths and they are hard things, can the wrong parts of us take it? And the wrong part of us, of course, will make us hate you, the human personality. Yes, the human personality. So that you don't even know that you're afraid of the truths that are, that are coming to you. Uh, Jim, then there. Well, when I get a kind of a feeling, you get an affection here for the truth when you, something you see all of a sudden frees you from yourself. Yes. Where That's you, good. And then, and then you, you kind of get a glimpse of that understanding and you see your a little bit of your compulsiveness leave you. And then you get kind of a, this is what is the magnet that draws you. That's right. We want freedom from ourselves, right? That's why we're here. We use, we're using everybody, you use me, I, don't you know I use you all the time for this aim. Uh, Larry, then Jim again. Similar to what Jim said, uh, for my part, I like the action of a certain member in this group, who at that time I saw myself rise up in anger against their action at that period of time. Now, that person riled up a snake pit in me that I wasn't even aware was there. Yeah. But at the moment, I was spoken to, I saw my fury, could do nothing with it but see it. Later I looked back and said, do you really have that much in you? Yes, you do, because it riled up. So, what I'm trying to say, uh, for the authentic or proper use of the word like to me, I must like the action of that person to help me to see deeper into myself. All right, Larry. Let me remind you, though, to try to think in short sentences. One it's idea. It's awfully hard for me. Yeah. Okay. Work at it. Well, we talked last week about contradictions, and it was amazing. A woman came up to Zena and said, "At the talk Wednesday night, this is fantastic. These truths." And then Zena said, well, they have classes in Boulder City. She said, Boulder City, that's 30 miles. <laughs> Remember the rich young man who went away from Christ? Christ told him, what did he tell him to do, Jim? The rich sell young man. Sell all that he had. Sell all he had. All yeah. Sell sell all you have waste as you put it a dollar's worth of gasoline on a round trip which do you want god or your buck well we another contradiction uh sunday night we were talking about going out to have something to eat yeah we we're deciding where to go and then somehow it came the thought came up to go to henderson and then i said no that's too far to drive and then jay as i said what a contradiction. You drive three times to go out to Boulder City to classes. <laughs> and I said, well, that's a different kind of food. <laughs> that was good. <laughs> 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 through the fire yeah. and you sit there and you say he's done it and it's my turn now that's right that's good that's and fine you can do it yeah you, you are you are an example of something that has been done 